on Zoom. So we're going to record this and um, and uh, hopefully then uh, post it to uh, to the website so that anyone that's unable to join us today uh, will have access. Uh, so that I'll kick off just a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, if you're not speaking, if you could uh, put your microphone to mute, I can see that most people have done that. I think that's really helpful uh, in terms of um, keeping the background noise to a minimum. Um, and you might also find if you're if you're not speaking by turning your camera off, uh, you might just get an extra bit of bandwidth on your your system, uh, which might just help uh, improve the overall uh, uh, performance. So, um, but feel feel free either way uh, on that one. Um, I'll, I'll just uh, quickly introduce uh, the team. We'll go around the table, um, as it were. Uh, with the panel that uh, we've put together representing the uh, the management board at UKWA, who are going to share some thoughts. But what we'd like to do uh, really today is, is make this as interactive as possible. So we will make time uh, before we end the session for some Q&A. So bounce your, your questions in. Um, but if anyone's got a burning question, um, as any of the panelists are sort of talking about these issues, please, a couple of things you can do. Turn your camera on and uh, put your hand up and I'll try and look out for anyone that's trying to get in with a question and we'll take questions as we go through. Um, there's also the chat facility on Zoom. So you can put a question in uh, there and we can perhaps uh, use that either in a, a live environment or when we get to the Q&A uh, session um, at the end. Um, and the other thing, it doesn't just have to be questions, uh, everyone. If you, um, as we're going through these various uh, issues, if you've got anything that you feel is worthy of contribution where you've been doing something in your own operation that uh, will be of interest uh, to the audience today and uh, for us to uh, sort of keep uh, keep note of as best practice. Please again shout up and please feel free to share your um, experiences. Um, so first of all, the panel um, of UKWA uh, management board then that are going to be here talking to you today. Let me start a quick introduction from from each um, as um, Scylla used to say. What's your name and where do you come from? A uh, very quick round the table. Uh, we'll start with um, with uh, Joanne. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Joanne Gummery. I'm the commercial manager at Paul Ponsonby Limited, and we're based in Birmingham. Thanks, Joe. Uh, next on my list here is uh, Steve Bladen, who's uh, safety manager at uh, Mini Clipper Logistics. Steve. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is Steve Bladen, uh, Business Process and Safety Manager at Mini Clipper, um, covering <laughs> four facilities in Bedfordshire. Thank you, Steve. And uh, Roger Lovelace at Import Services. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as uh, Peter said, uh, Import Services, I'm the Operations Director. We're running a, a multi site uh, warehousing business, uh, primarily based in Southampton, part of the Expediator Group. Thanks, uh, Roger. And uh, John Manelli at uh, John Lewis. Uh, hi, everybody. Afternoon. Um, I'm John Manelli. I'm head of operations with John Lewis. I'm responsible for all of our uh, distribution operations um, throughout the UK, including those run by our third party operations. Thank you, John. Uh, Graham Mundy, Stobart in Aviation Services. Uh, Good morning, Peter. Uh, Graham Andy, Managing Director for Stobart Aviation Services, uh, responsible for cargo and passenger handling across uh, five UK airports. And last but by no means least, uh, Gary Whittle at Meacher's Global Logistics. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as Peter says, Gary Whittle, I'm the Commercial and Operations Director at Meacher's Global Logistics, based in Southampton and Derby. Thanks, Gary. And uh, we also had uh, Neil Bowker, who's the chief executive of uh, Bowker Group. Uh, I understand he's got a board meeting uh, this morning that uh, looks as though it's gone on uh, over time. So uh, Neil may be joining us um, as, uh, as we go through, but uh, we'll introduce Neil as and when he's able to join. 
So I mentioned we we had a, a session of uh, that group of panel and one one or two more of our management board uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we found actually that in terms of managing and dealing with COVID, um, things fell into three uh, kind of key areas really. There's the protection of our employees in the workplace. There's the protection of the workplace itself and making the workplace uh, COVID secure. And, and then there's the impact of both of those things and the wider sort of pandemic and some of the bigger issues on the actual business itself in terms of the P&L, if you like, which is obviously what we're all um, interested in. So we've structured the agenda here to sort of tackle things um, in those three uh, key areas. So as I say, please feel free to uh, to jump in and ask any questions or or share your um, experiences with us as we as we go through this. Um, perhaps to kick us off, then uh, back to back to Joanne, Joe, just to sort of lead us off, uh, having started yeah. this uh, this process, um, focusing in on the employees first. Then, so what have you guys done at Paul Ponsonby in terms of um, the employee protection. So, thank you, Peter. Uh, so we made some um, quite generic changes um, where we uh, put hand sanitizer stations around the building. Um, we introduced uh, masks as well, where there was uh, where two meter rule couldn't be adhered to. Um, we also had one way systems around the building, such as the toilets and the canteen areas, mm -hmm. where again it was harder to manage the traffic of people. Um, we also did an individual risk assessment with each member of staff. Uh, and that was in order to um, just make sure that they were aware of what they could be doing to uh, further enhance um, the cleaning regimes. For example, for a Bendy driver, um, he could clean down um, the areas around the truck that he's touching so that if somebody else then touches that truck, it's already been sanitized. Um, and yeah, and then once we had the individual risk assessments, we then um, asked everybody if they were comfortable um, if they were happy with what we've done uh, and we've just been rolling forward with that really. Yeah you mentioned um, masks there um, Joe. just on that, mm -hmm. um, that point um, have you have you had to make the wearing of masks sort of mandatory in the workplace how are you dealing with uh, the wearing of masks? Um, so we've got uh, two main areas in our warehouse. One side is around 40,000 square foot and only has about six employees. So we haven't enforced mask wearing in that area due to the amount of space. However, the other side, around 30,000 square foot, has over 25 employees. So we've had to make it mandatory to wear a face mask in that area. But what we've also had to do is make it mandatory so that if office staff or any other person is walking through that area, they have to put on a mask as well. Okay, um, so just op opening it up a little bit there, um, John uh, John Manelli at John Lewis, just on on masks. You've got a big workforce down there. How are you? Um, how are you handling this particular situation? Uh, yeah, yeah, very similar to Joe with all of the um, <clears throat> all of the supplementary kind of um, actions and processes we're putting in place. Uh, Covid marshals and all sorts of things. With, with masks, we actually introduced last week um, a uh, a policy where all individuals coming into the workplace had to wear their masks from the point they leave their car in the car park to the point they get to their place of work, whether that's behind a pack station, on a, on a forklift truck, uh, etc., or working in a more manual environment. Now, <clears throat> as you said before, we, we've got some quite big facilities. The, um, the one in Milton Keynes is just over 2 million square foot, and... Um, when we get to peak, which is our biggest risk area, we'll, we'll probably have around about 1,500 um, full-time equivalents across the 24 hours, seven days a week. So the um, it was really the employees themselves, our partners, that were calling out for them additional measures. And um, they were introduced quite seamlessly. They've gone down really well. Uh, so I think there is a um, an expectation from, from the shop floor, if you will, that these additional measures make, make everybody safe. Um, so, so yeah, the, the wearing the mask is uh, is in place across our network. We're trying to encourage our third parties to go the same way. Um, and I think the biggest watch out really, uh, Peter, is the the influx of agency resource uh, is where we are, um, is, is where we got the real watch out there because they're obviously not part of the bubble and, and not part of the current culture. 
No, thanks, John. Well, we'll we'll come back to that and have a, a slightly um, wider chat about uh, sort of agency and, and, and temporary staff. Um, Steve, anything to add, mini clipper wise, just on uh, on mass or, or PPE? And I, I do want to just throw it out there and ask what the issues were for everyone about obtaining um, PPE and availability of PPE, both at the start of the of the pandemic now and what the sort of future expectation is. But Steve, any um, any thoughts from you in terms of what you've had to do mandatorily or, or are your staff sort of leading the process on this? Uh, well, the government has, has helped us big time by relaying everything on the media uh, about what the guidelines are. Um, although it seems to be rolling back a bit, we're not rolling back a bit. We're, we're going with the initial first wave uh, precautions that we've all put in place. Um, we've been lucky enough to keep a steady supply of sanitising equipment and uh, masks as we hold stock for some of the providers of those uh, said items. Uh, so we haven't been in a shortage of any of those at all, uh, which has been lucky for us. Um, workplace adjustments, we've been well up on that with um, keeping control of what we need. Uh, regular passive checks of all the stations for sanitising equipment, for wipes, uh, for processes in place, for face masks. Um, since our last um, online meeting, Peter, we, um, we've adapted to the reusable masks now rather than the disposable ones. So that's, um, that's another uh, sustainable step forward for us as well, uh, being as it, it, it could potentially go on for a while. Uh, the workforce themselves have been absolutely fantastic with understanding why we're doing what we're doing. Some of it's uncomfortable with on the back of containers, handball in stock, um, but we put measures in place for rotation of staff, um, regular breaks, but all controlled with PPE. And um, yeah, it's working well in yeah. under the current conditions. And, and what about the availability of PPE? You're okay there at, uh, at Mini Clipper, then you say you've got some stocks in that. Um, Roger, come to you down at Import Services. Did you have any challenges at the beginning of the process? Is it, how is it now? And it, as we go into this sort of second wave, are you, are you anticipating any issues around PPE? Not particularly, uh, Peter. We uh, can concur really with the other comments from your colleagues uh, in terms of uh, what we've done. Um, as part of the group, we directly sourced uh, from China at the very beginning um, large quantities, actually, because we saw this sustaining for actually way beyond this initial phase. And I think that judgment has proven to be sound um, considering where we are today. So we, we have direct access to supplies from China and those channels have remained open. Uh, we, we don't currently store any PPE for clients. Um, uh, it's something that we have had opportunities to do, but um, the, the quantities required are sort of large in terms of 10,000 pallets plus, and we just don't have that kind of capacity at this time of year. So we've had to deny um, those opportunities, but in terms of our own use, um, we actually have, uh, we are considering mandating it, but we haven't done so yet. We're just under a, a consultation period with the workforce. Um, but I would reiterate just finally what uh, John said from, from John, John Lewis. I think um, the integration of agency staff, which I know we're going to talk about later, has proven to be our biggest challenge on a daily basis in terms of maintaining the various protocols that obviously we have to do at this difficult time. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks, Roger. Well, we'll come back to, to that one um, shortly. Just just on, uh, on the employees. Um, Graham, I mean, for, I think most of our most of our operators, it's sort of very much, you know, in house and so on, and it's within the community. Taking the point about um, temporary labour, um, but what about those operations that are actually facing perhaps more into the general public? Graham, I'm coming to you here with your uh, experiences at uh, at Stobart Aviation. Um, how have you? Is, is there? Have you had to do anything? differently in terms of preparing your employees for that interaction with the public? Um, thank you, Peter. Um, it, it's, it's been quite, um, there's been so many mixed messages given out by the government of where face masks, coverings uh, should be, shouldn't be worn. So 
advising and guiding the general public that when they enter an airport prior to them arriving, they are to be covered with either a shield or a face mask or a disposable one. We, we've, we still see and um, our safety reports ping through every couple of days, passengers refusing to wear them, uh, even though it's other than the people that have got a, a disability or a, a, um, a mitigation document that says I don't need to wear them. So it's trying to ensure um, that people are wearing them. Our, our staff, they're, they're, they're paid a good salary, but they're not there as um, COVID experts or COVID police, as um, some people call them when they ask them to cover up. Uh, so we've had to do a lot of education with staff and almost take it back to the point where it's now don't get into the argument, pass it on to a, a supervisor, a colleague, or unfortunately, uh, when they get quite um, abusive, it's the police. And people do get removed from airports um, and they are removed from the environment. But in general, um, you'd probably say 95% of the passenger um, that are flying through the airports, they are arriving either with a covering, a shield. Some are, um, you would think they were about to spray a, 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 an automotive or a, a, or a forklift or a vehicle. They've, they've come in full suits. Um, so we've seen some very strange uh, interpretations of what a face covering is, but the majority of people are. But it's, it's educating our staff and our colleagues um, to just be polite, be respectful. That's, uh, that's been our biggest thing. Everywhere is covered in sanitizer. Every airport, you if, before you even get to the airport, you'll see sanitizers outside and um, different, different interpretations of the heat checking as well. Um, we've not seen that that's proved a viable solution yet, and we haven't followed it, but um, we know the airports are looking at it to try and uh, help. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of um, sort of shared equipment that the workforce is using, and of course, you know, in our sector, it's all about kind of hand scanners and, and headsets for, you know, those that are using kind of voice picking uh, systems and so on. Um, John, can, anything that you can share with us in terms of how you're dealing with this shared equipment? Because a lot of you know, with the slim margins that we're all dealing on, it's not one set of equipment for every employee, is it? And it is going to be passed around. How are you, how are you dealing with those things? No, well, unfortunately, we haven't been able to push the budget as far as uh, giving everybody their own forklift truck. Um, <laughs> not, not just yet, but um, it's a really good point. And I think as Joe and the rest of the guys have acknowledged, the actual um, practice of cleaning your workstation or your work area or your piece of equipment before you actually start work is is um is really well baked in now and i think people are, are being quite um uh, you know grown up and uh, responsible about, about about the whole process um I, I think that's really crucial i think um when it comes to um uh, the, the use of kind of um uh, sanitizer and, uh, and and cleaning equipment etc we, we've even looked at things like bio misting as a as a, a precautionary uh, way of cleaning things down um, I, I will touch on it later if we get a chance. We had the uh, we, we we actually brought in the environmental health officer and the local health officer from the Milton Keynes district into our big site in Milton Keynes uh, last week to get some kind of guidance on you know how we were doing things. And on that particular point, bio misting. If anybody is um, considering trying it, I think it, uh, forget about it. It's not deemed as a safe practice. So we really have been trying to think of some really adventurous kind of interesting ways of um, coping with that cleaning aspect. But so far, touch wood, the, the processes and procedures we've adopted have kept us safe so far. And I, I hate to keep relating to it, but once we start seeing this huge influx of agency, uh, colleagues, and they'll represent about 75% of our workforce during our peak period, so it's a massive number, uh, it's, it's maintaining that kind of um, that, that practice and that way of doing things is going to be... Um, probably the most difficult part of the, the COVID venture so far for us. Yeah, so big, big challenge on that one. Gary, we haven't heard from you yet. Have you um, have you got temporary labour in your operation uh, down there? Yeah, always. Um, I would just, just like to reinforce what most of the colleagues have said, to be honest. Um, we're a bit like Steve with devanning containers. We've been forced masks in that very sort of um, constrained area, confined area. Uh, but other than that, we've, the warehouses are big enough and the offices are big enough, we think, to, to keep the isolation. I, I think one of the key things that's come out of this, Peter, for me, is, is the communication process to whether it's staff, visitors, drivers, agency. 
we, we've had to be incredibly consistent as a management team, ensuring that we communicate to everybody thoroughly to the point where we're actually explaining our logic. It, they may not agree with the logic, but at least that they understand it. We found most people have been quite receptive um, and quite supportive. So, I, I, you know, we got everyone in this, in, in this uh, call probably got slightly different opinion about how they do things. It doesn't mean they're wrong. Um, but from our perspective, I think we've just explained as much as we can, as often as we can. Yeah, thanks, Gary. And, and then just on some, you know, sort of practical issues in terms of, has anybody had any experience of, you know, staff it sort of ties in, I guess, to the to the temporary labour um, a, a little bit in terms of, you know, rearranging shift patterns and cover for sickness and absence? I mean, what's what's the general trend of things? How much is the self isolating or the reluctance to come to work just in terms of, yeah, I better take a day. I've got a bit of a sore throat. I better take a day here to make sure you know, that I'm not infected or I'm going to go off and get a test. I mean, what, what experiences have you uh, have you had in terms of um, sort of dealing with the the increased level of kind of sickness or absence um, around this? Steve, let's see if you're up there in the top left of my screen. So I'm coming to you first on this one. Uh, no problem. Uh, yeah, touched on earlier workplace adjustments due to sickness absence or whatever it hasn't been uh, too big a deal we've been um, very fortunate to have low sickness and absence rates uh, throughout this uh, not due to contraction but um, family members etc um, potentially having these um, symptoms uh, but we've been pretty lucky with that so far um, in the instances where we've had to have agency covering for um, areas where we couldn't cover by flexing our people and our own people jumping in to assist, um, that's been very stringent with uh, the induction processes. We don't let them on site unless we've gone through the agency first and said, right, we need the old guys to do a self-assessment. Uh, our self-assessment that's online, they can do that. So we can have a see. Uh, what their condition is, what the little bit of their history is without going into GDPR uh, so that we're secure in understanding that we're getting people on site, uh, mixing with our people at a distance um, safely and understand exactly where we're coming from. Um, as I'm sure we, uh, the colleagues here are, are going through the same process of keeping outsiders away from our own bubble, as it were as much as possible, uh, ensuring all the PPEs in place. And touching on something Gary said earlier is, I'd say that most of our workforce are really stepping up in the fact that we haven't got to keep relaying to them where your PPE. If we've got someone from outside coming in, pretty much the workforce are saying, make sure you wear this or do this, make sure you sanitize that. So the workforce themselves are stepping up and enforcing our rules as well. So that's always great to see because uh, we're doing these passive checks and they're happy with the way we're conducting our surveys out there and they're doing it themselves. It's, it's, it's a great warm fuzzy feeling that um, I'm sure all your workforces are as well, uh, looking after themselves and their colleagues. Yeah, Steve, you mentioned um, sort of GDPR there. There was one thing that I, I'd like to ask uh, the panel is um, your experiences on the NHS app. Are you, you know, encouraging your employees to use it? Are your employees encouraging you to allow them to use in, in, in the workplace? And I know this, this app sort of working on mobile phones is um, potentially a bit of an issue in terms of, you know, most sites that I visit, you know, personal mobile phones get sort of left in the locker room and not taken into the workplace. Um, you know, John, how are you, how are you dealing with this you know, highly secure site that you have at, at John Lewis? How are you, are, are employees wanting to take their mobile phones in to use the app? Yeah, we've, um, we've had to adjust our security policies and we're now applying unique um, removable barcodes on the back of all um, approved devices. So, um, and that's on the proof that the phone contains the uh, NHS app. So we're not allowing um, 
partners or, or, or agency to bring phones in that haven't got the app. But if, you can, if they can prove that the NH app, um, NHS app is actually on the phone, they'll have a barcode placed on the back of their phone and there's a scanning device that allows us to, um, that, that kind of approved device to actually enter the building and come out of the building. Uh, which was quite a big move to us, as you know, we got a few million pounds worth of um, quite expensive wearable technology, iPhones, etc. So it's a big move. But um, and again, there's lots of talk out there about people leaving their phones in the uh, lockers with the app applied next to a locker also with a phone with the app, <laughs> which can um, send the track and trace uh, whole kind of uh, the idea of track and trace into a, a real frenzy thinking that two people have been stuck together all day and it's actually two phones in a locker. So it gets rid of that, uh, that challenge as well. Yeah, no, thanks, John. Any, just put your hands up. Anyone else, any experience of the app? Dave, Dave McCutcheon up in uh, Glasgow. Uh, sorry, I put my hand up there just to speak about something that happened to us yesterday and then I'll, I'll come on to the app. Um, and it's something people may bear in mind. We, we brought in um, an interviewee yesterday a very important position we felt within the company. So we brought somebody on the site for an interview. We have been doing most of them through Zoom um, or Teams meetings. Um, the guy sat down and within two minutes explained he was just back from holiday from Spain, which was just unbelievable. But it, it alerted us to the, the issues when, you, when you're inviting people onto site now, which well, certainly up in Scotland, I feel it's happened over the last few months a few weeks we've we'll, we'll started to relax a little and say right okay let's maybe go and visit a customer and, and not do everything over teams but it's something that people may be um, as well been alert to anybody coming and say where have they been it, it was absolutely gobsmacking but but there you are and um, in terms of the app yeah we we put it out to all the staff um, and left it up to them whether they, they take it up or not um, i think the majority to be fair have um, we've had a, you know, a couple of track and trace incidents, but touch wood today, um, we've, we've been pretty COVID free in terms of staff. One, one of the things I would say as well, it was mentioned earlier, was um, the situation regarding you know, people having the sniffles and saying, I'd rather have a wee day at home. Um, we've obviously got two sites. One is our distribution site at Bothell, and we've got a storage site here at Bailiston. Um, and we've got over 100 staff. One of the comments all our directors made is that, that virtually to a man, everybody um, stuck to their job, got their head down, didn't mump and moan, just done their job. And, and I think we're grateful that under the current climate that, that they had a good job. Um, and at tantamount, I, I've certainly found speaking to colleagues that most people have been exactly the same. We've just not found the, the numbers we thought would take advantage of this. Brilliant. Thanks. Uh, thanks for that, Dave. I, I saw a hand up from Emma. Emma Lightfoot, did you want to ask uh, a question? Please just unmute yourself and uh, and jump in, Emma, if that was uh, anything other than a, there's a sort of glitch on, on the system. Um, Joanne has actually just um, uh, thrown a good comment in, which is how, um, you know, what's the, what's the experience of disposing you know of the disposable masks these are becoming increasingly a bit of a hazard in the workplace joe do you want to pick up on that thread um yeah so what we've started to notice now um is that we've got the, the masks and they that they could end up on the floor they're on the side in the canteen um people are getting through two to three a day and it just seems to be ordering boxes of them um and we're more concerned about the impact of that environmentally could we switch to something that's more sustainable? Um, and it was just a question that I wanted to throw out there, really. Is anybody doing it? Is anyone doing it better and has found a solution that suits their, their entire workforce? Because obviously you've got, you know, male, female, different sizes and that type of thing. Yeah, OK, Joe. Well, thanks for that. If anyone wants to uh, comment on that, just again, put a hand up and I'll uh, try and get you into the... Uh, into the conversation. Look, just in the interest of time, we, we covered quite a lot there in terms of the employees. Let's let's move on to, I know it's kind of overlaps and similar, but I mean, in terms of the, the workplace itself, um, you know, John mentioned that the process for the safety of employees sort of starts with the, you know, the arrival in the car park and so on. Um, I'm just interested again to sort of go around the table and just get a feel for what you've had to do 
in the workplace in terms of dealing with visiting drivers, um, one-way systems in terms of your working practices, any other kind of impacts around security and emergency, these sorts of things, really workplace related. Um, Roger, what can you um, can you share anything with us from uh, import services on this? Yeah, um, Peter, apart from the obvious, I think most of our focus has really been on um, the, the higher risk presented by a agency staff. Um, we don't have the numbers that John Lewis have, but, you know, a couple of hundred uh, across the business as we go into peak, probably peaking at about 280. Um, what we've done is we've always had an operations support group um, that provide training, development, health and safety facilities management guidance to the people on the front line doing the order execution. Um, so what we've actually done is just bolstered and added people into that team um, so that there are more people um, actively ensuring compliance, not just with COVID, but with just general health and safety. And, and we've certainly reviewed uh, and upgraded our entire induction process, which, as you rightly say, starts from outside the building as they come in. Um, the other thing we have done, I think we're not generally big enough in terms of spend to have an embed from tier one agencies, but um, working with our primary agency this year, um, we have insisted that they have an embed person uh, on site, not 24 seven, um, but certainly throughout the Monday to Friday period, just to help and assist us um, with that extra uh, requirement really to, to keep people on side in, in terms of the COVID uh, requirements throughout the facility. So those are some of the small things that we've done and it has made a difference. And I think, I'm, I'm sure we're not alone, but you know, our costs in this area are non-recoverable. So this is a hit uh, to already tight margins, but uh, frankly, there's not much that uh, we can do about that. We just have to live with it. That's uh, that's great, Roger. And we'll, we will come back and talk about that <laughs> shortly when we get into the sort of impact of all of this onto, onto our P&Ls and, and, and what we can do. And in fact, whether, whether this industry, um, you know, that's increasingly now in, in the sort of... Uh, you know the, the 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 eyes of the government and and the general public. I mean, in terms of keeping the economy going, you know, we, we've got the sort of classification of essential workers, but we're not actually getting any help from the government as yet, and we are keeping yep. things going. So you, many of you will know where, you know, we're we're really pressing hard for business rates holidays and things. But let's let's come back to to that. Um, I noticed that Neil Bowker has now uh, joined us. Neil, if you could turn your camera on and uh, give us uh, 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 perhaps a few comments of what you've been doing in the Bowker Group, purely around, you know, more around the uh, the workplace than the employees themselves. No, Neil's gone. Can you can you hear me, Peter, or not? Yes, Derek, I can. Welcome. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Um, I, I've had trouble because of the battery on my, so I'm actually having to do it from my telephone. So sorry if I am uh, seem a bit small. Um, one of the things that we uh, um, have been looking at, particularly we run two operations. One is uh, an animal feed operation and um, uh, we're getting a lot of foreign drivers coming in, bringing raw materials and uh, deliveries in. And, the, and the, on the other hand, we have farm farmers and um, collection and HGVs and all of those we've we've been going all the way right from February all the way through never missed a day um, feeding livestock means you've got to be there every day um, and um, we have people people are very disciplined as long as they know what they're doing and um, we've had to we've made sure that we um, wipe all the keypads because they've got to put numbers in and all of that and we talk to drivers from the cab so that we have a the pull side and an office window so they don't get out the um uh, are able to to discuss and i think that innovative ways that the drivers themselves don't want to get in contact with us because they realize that they're coming on to these estates how, how are other people finding and we have separate toilets and everything else for them how's everyone else um finding that side with dealing with particular foreign drivers and other drivers yeah dave's got his hand up there so uh, i guess can uh, give us a comment 
Yeah, very, very similar, uh, Derek. We, you know, we get a lot of foreign drivers in. Um, they come into a, a reception area, and what, one of the things we've done, we've found very, very helpful. Uh, my son does all our IT. We set up a QR code, um, so any driver arriving, um, they immediately can scan the QR code, and it takes them straight into our web page. And then there's five or six questions they need to fill in basically their company name, their name and address, what country they've come from, etc. how long they've been in the country. And um, there's various questions you can add. And, and that's been a fantastic help because it's enabled us to compile a, you know, a quick list of who's turning up on site. Um, and, and if there's any, obviously, visits from the government, we can show that as part of our uh, COVID policy. So the QR code um, is a great idea and it's been fantastic for us. Very, very quick way to, to harness all the visitors. And is that is that relatively is that relatively simple to set up, uh, Dave? Yeah, you can just pick them up off the internet, make your own one up, and then connect questions to it through your web page. Um, what I can do if you want is I can I can get a wee um, update from my son and, and pass it around the members. Okay, um, I've got a question just coming in uh, around sort of training. I think from from Lynn Parnell at Logistics Partners. Lynn's asking. For people that may need to visit various sites, is there any industry recognised training and certification for these people to show they have a proper understanding of COVID procedures and requirements? Um, I don't know who to come to with that question. Um, Gary, I haven't can, heard from you in a I, while. Can just I, yeah. In terms of training. Hold on, Derek, let me just come back to you. Gary? Are you aware yeah. of any training uh, related Thanks, specifically to COVID? <laughs> No, I'm not. Um, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Um, our compliance team would, would, would review that. Um, I do think that from our perspective, we've kept relatively robust records, a bit like Dave was saying earlier on about who's coming on site, the inductions that we're doing, getting people to sign track and trace forms if they're not using the NHS app. Um, but an interesting development with that one for me is what do you do when you get the information? So Obviously, we're recording who does what. We get notified that an individual has attended site. What are the implications thereafter? And I think one of the things, I appreciate we've got very limited time today, Peter, but one of the things I do think needs some discussion is what happens when you get that information? What do you, what do, you do? What do you plan for your business on receipt of that phone call? I managed to neatly avoid your question, I think. Yeah, no, that's that's fine, Gary. Let's come back to uh, Derek then, because I think Derek was going to uh, answer Lynn's uh, question. No, no, the, 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 the only thing that we do is, particularly before we have visitors, um, I'm sure everyone else has, we send them a, a note uh, which they've got to sign before they come to say they've not been in contact with anyone and they've all, all you know, that government regulation thing. But we get them to sign visitors you can't do that with drivers, I must say, but external visitors, we send that. Is that what everyone else is doing? What are they doing? Yeah, Steve, what's, uh, what are you doing at Mini Clipper about visitors to, uh, to the workplace? That's a good question. And I was going to put my hand up for that one, actually. <laughs> so, um, I've been debating, well, we were using forms to fill in and uh, sending to people, and they got to send back with this preset load of questions. Uh, but I've been developing, and it's active now, uh, Microsoft Forms. Uh, you create a form with um, a set of specific questions. We've got about eight questions, and we've got visitors ones, drivers ones. Uh, the link just gets emailed out to the respective person or the visitors, um, and they just click on it. It takes them to the form. they just got to fill it in. Uh, yes, no's, and is pretty easy to use. Um, when they submit it, it comes back to myself and the compliance team to review that form to see if they meet the criteria of uh, whether they're safe, whether they've got um, anyone in the family, all those pre preset questions. And then at that point, we um, approve or decline the request depending on the answers. And on the approval and decline, they get automatic uh, responses as well. And anything they've filled out goes automatically recording on Office 365 on the forms. Uh, so we can, if it's someone visiting another site and me or the compliance team have 
um, approved it or denied it, we then get a copy of that from online because it's on there, it's on the screen. We just uh, print it to PDF and send it to the relative um, site manager so they're aware of the circumstances. So when that person turns up, if they're okay, there's the form in front of them, all done within 24 hours of a visit. And if denied, then they've got to make a phone call to the site manager. It's all documented. Um, that's working incredibly well for us. Uh, but going further than that, we're on restriction. We're not allowing customers or visitors anywhere near our facilities unless it's operationally critical and they've got to go through these processes as well. Yeah, I always found it's good to keep customers What's away from What's anyone doing? I think the, the earlier... Go on, Derek. Sorry, was that a question? So, sorry, I was going to... The, the earlier question was, what are we doing when we collect it, all this information? My understanding is you've got to keep it for 21 days. What's anyone else's understanding? What is anyone doing with it? Well, give from, them, from my give, perspective... Give everyone oh. time. Go on, Steve, sorry. So from my perspective, as it's on Office 365, it's just all automatically accumulating. Um, it'll just stay there forever and a day. So record keeping for us on that score isn't an issue. And, and Roger, anything from you on this in terms of just dealing with visitors to site and uh, be they uh, external or um, you know customers and or suppliers? Uh, pretty much as before from colleagues' comments, Peter. Um, I think the only thing that we did from day one, once it became obvious that temperature was a you know an indicator in terms of symptoms. Um, we, we just asked permission to take their temperature. It's one of the requirements of coming on site. But similar to everybody else, we, we've been trying to avoid any visits at all, if possible. Um, I would say in the last probably four to six weeks, we've, we've allowed more um, where they're critical to the business leading into peak. Um, but that temperature capture, obviously, it, it does really require consent. But I have to say we've had 100% compliance. And similar to uh, the previous comment, we, we captured the information initially um, on handwritten lists, uh, and we're seeking to turn that into some kind of electronic form as this appears to be going on for, well, who knows, but some considerable time. So we'll have to turn that into an electronic record. Um, but apart from those two things, Peter, I think the temperature capture for us, we have had one or two people who were borderline um, and close to the limit where they really can't come on site. Um, but we haven't actually refused entry to anybody thus far. No, thanks. Um, thanks, Roger. So I, I'm going to move on now to the sort of impacts on the business and, and, and come to you, uh, Roger, because you, you, you commented on this. I mean, in terms of the, um, the cost to the business, I mean, how do you, how do you see you know, import services recovering this and sort of over what period of time? And is there anything that, uh, that as the Trade Association, UKWA can do to carry any messages, um, you know, back to back to government or any other stakeholders that can help in this process. Yeah, I think just a few comments, Vida. Obviously, being part of a, a larger group uh, as we are uh, today, a part of the Expedator Group, um, discussions really at our board, sort of board level back in March, April, May were: could we apply uh, a COVID surcharge? Um, you know, especially to handling operations where we had distancing, um, obviously providing limitations around productivity. Um, I have to say, I think, you know, this industry has uh, an unbelievably resilient workforce, um, hardworking and productive. And although it took some time um, for things to settle, particularly in the early days, I think previous people have commented, we've been doing this now for some considerable time, I mean, seven months plus and, and carry on doing it today and probably into the future. So what we've done is we've reviewed all our processes and tried to close that gap in terms of the impact of distancing. Um, and I think we would find it difficult um, today. We didn't apply the surcharging. Um, and I think bearing in mind the work that we've done to improve things, um, I think apart from the on cost of support around inductions training and compliance and perhaps the provision of PPE, uh, we don't feel that we could justify uh, a surcharge. And I think, quite frankly, most of our clients in this current economic environment would actually struggle to accept it. So we've taken the view uh, best to not pursue that currently. I think if this looked like going well into next year, um, our board would certainly 
uh, review that decision. Uh, and maybe we would have to uh, put it in across the board. Um, but it is a very difficult time for everybody in business. And, and our clients obviously are our key to our long term survival as a business. So we, we've taken that decision not to do it. But the impact on the business is uh, ha has been a knock on P&L, as I'm sure it has been for most people. Um, but right now we can't see a way of recovering it um, and don't want to have those potentially very difficult conversations with clients as we're going into peak. And what about the um, what about the, the the impact on productivity? So you've talked quite a lot there about the on cost of providing yeah. all of the, the measures uh, that, that you have. But what about just the impact on productivity? I mean, surely, you know, with all of these sort of different shift patterns and one way systems and, and social distancing in the workplace, Roger, you know, you can't be getting as much out the door as you were pre-COVID. Is that is that a fair assumption? I think it's a fair assumption, and that, that is the reality. Um, interestingly for us, we don't normally operate 24-7 uh, for the entire year, and, and our docks facility, which is our largest uh, facility by, by square footage, um, we, we went early this year on 24-7, and that's actually smoothed demand. Um, through, you know, across that lengthy period of time. So that's actually assisted us because we're open for longer. So we, we're taking a facility cost uh, on the chin. You know, the lights are on for longer if you want to use that analogy. Um, but in our other facilities, which are smaller, um, we've actually gone to a 24-5 shift type pattern uh, to assist with that distancing question. Um, and it'll, we, we haven't done it for long enough to really understand the impact of that. Um, obviously, having the buildings open for longer is a cost to the business, um, but we're hoping um, that it's going to be negligible. And I, th I think we just need to get through this next 10, 12 week period to really understand the impact on us. We do. I think it's a bit early to call it. OK, John, you uh, put your hand up there. You're going to come yeah. in some productivity. <laughs> uh, yeah, get your tissues out, Tam. But the um, I mean, our, our productivity across the whole of the network I would suggest is somewhere in the region of 10 to 15 percent degradation through the measures we're having to deploy whether that's um, cleaning down the workstations and equipment before people start work the same at the end of their shift um, when they go for their breaks we're obviously trying to stagger the shift so they're not all clumbered together bumped up behind each other um, what one that I think is absolutely brand new and, and I'm grappling with at the moment are and, and it might be something the organisation can help get some clarity on, uh, Peter, is the, is the onerous obligations we're now seeing about the use of workplace canteens. Um, and in the John Lewis world, they're called partners dining rooms, as you'd expect, but uh, workplace canteens, which are being deemed a places of hospitality. And therefore, the recording of individuals using those facilities, whether they're um, actually purchasing uh, goods and services from the canteen itself or bringing their own um, their own food in and sitting in the table and using the facilities is being deemed have to be recorded. Now, because of the uncertainty and the lack of 100% compliance with the app and the QR code scanning, we're being told by the authorities, and we've got to put um, measure that, we have to record um, by, on paper with pens if we if we can't get 100% compliance to the use of apps and QR codes, the individual's name and the time they've used the facility, um, because otherwise everybody using that facility will be deemed by the AHO as being in a cluster should there be a confirmed case of somebody using the facilities at the same time. And so it, it's all you know in line with the kind of productivity piece. If we have to go to them measures, Again, with the hundreds, thousands of people we're going to be putting through our distribution centres, that 10 or 15 percent is going to completely is going to drift even further north, um, make, making the whole profitability of what we're trying to do get kind of un, quite unpalatable. So I, I was interested if anybody else has started to grapple with that same obligation. Yeah, John, that's um, that's quite concerning, isn't it? If that was a trend across the industry, I mean, yeah. that you know, what was it, 10 to 15 percent degradation on? Yeah. On productivity, Gary, Gary um, how's how are you seeing this in uh, in Meachers, just in terms of productivity rather than direct on cost? Uh, very similar to Roger, actually. Um, I, I kind of support pretty well everything Roger said. So we've looked at changing shift patterns, opening longer hours, moving things around to just spread the risk a little bit. So productivity is definitely down. It, it's it's difficult to get a proper measure doing what we do. Um, 
I would say it's below 10%, which I know uh, John's just mentioned. Um, but it's very difficult to measure across the across a whole working week, given the volumes. What I would say is, uh, picking up uh, Steve's point earlier on, the staff have been far more um, compliant than I anticipated, and actually so have our customers. So we, we've said that you know there's slight changes to what they expected and what they want and what they're willing to pay for, uh, and we've explained the situation, and, and without fail, everyone's accepted that. So I think, again, it's around communication, but I do think if it goes on, much longer, then we, we may have to think about how we recover some of that productivity loss. And has anybody, uh, you know, I'll start with you on this, Gary. I mean, how, I think you mentioned earlier, you know, or, or it was Roger, reluctance to be passing on any additional cost to, to customers who are probably already sort of in a, a situation of not struggling necessarily, but challenged to sort of pay the bills on time and so on. Is it having an effect on our cash flow? And, and, and is anybody out there taking advantage of government schemes, the C-bill scheme or the bounce back loan scheme? Or, you know, has anybody approached their local authority for rates relief and, and so on? I mean, Gary, how serious is this issue, do you think, in the industry? Well, I think very much like Roger, we've taken the view as a board that the marketplace is not probably not willing to accept any increases in the short term. Um, I think there have been a number of significant one-off costs. So in addition to pretty well everything Roger and Steve have just said and John said, um, we, we've had to do things like, I think purchase something like 18 laptops to make us resilient that, you know, if we have to shut down an office facility, we can work from home. So there are a lot of one-off costs, one-way systems, uh, screens, PPE. So there's a lot of one-off stuff um, that we've managed to fund. I think if there's another push and there's another issue around productivity around the, the operations team, office team being out of work, then we would have a problem, I think, and we would have to communicate that to our customers. But we're beginning to do that. We're beginning to talk a little bit more openly about the situation, what it means. We've done things, as you mentioned earlier, about talking to our landlords, talking to uh, the vehicle um, leasing companies. We just try and mitigate that wherever we can. But... Um, most of these people are in this very similar position. So I think I think everyone agrees and everyone would like to help. I'm not sure many people are in the position to do so. No, thanks, Gary. I was going to come to Jo and she just put a hand up as well. Jo, just in terms of continuing this discussion, but particularly what do you think what do you think we at UKWA can be doing to uh, to help through this process? Um, well, actually, I was just going to kind of touch upon something um, slightly different, if I could just say that first, Peter, if you don't mind. So we are a smaller company and we have a very lean management structure here. So we've only got a certain level of supervisors and then people like myself who are more office based. And what we found is that with all the additional tasks and paperwork and different shifts is that it's putting a lot of pressure um, on that level within the company. So, you know, I've had to take on quite a lot of the COVID tasks. We'll sort of highlight that. We don't have a dedicated health and safety manager. We outsource that. Um, so we're also finding that there's pressure that we're trying to put more work out onto him. And then he's finding more of his clients um, are, are also in a similar situation. So whether uh, UKWA could put something together for smaller companies, but where we need advice with the HR side of things, the health and safety, any generic paperwork that, that you could share, perhaps that's something. Sorry, I thought I'd unmuted. Thanks, Joe. Um, we did actually set up the sort of COVID um, resources hub on the website back in the early days. And there's quite a lot of information in there that a number of our associate members sort of stepped in because they're, you know, as you know, many of the associate members are specializing in in different areas either hr or health and safety and uh, and so on and workplace uh, management so there's quite a bit there but i think it's as we as we're sort of going into a different seasonal impact now it's probably time for us to revisit that and have a look and see what's there and, and maybe a bit of update so um yeah thanks for that um, I'm just conscious of time, uh, everyone. I think you know. Again, it's been a it's been a really good, lively, interactive uh, session. Does anyone um, does anyone have any questions that they'd like to uh, to put to the panel or to me or 
before we, we, we sort of start to wrap up the session. There've been a couple of comments on the, in the chat room regarding GDPR. Thanks to uh, Lynn and Emma for raising those issues. And uh, I saw also that Steve had volunteered to uh, just sort of step in and take that one offline and come back with some answers. So we'll, we'll pick up on that. I, I, I have to say, I'm not quite sure on whether GDPR has just gone out of the window uh, as a result of uh, COVID. Um, or whether it's going to go out of the window come January the 1st for other reasons. Um, but certainly one thing that I picked up on today is communication. That word has been mentioned, um, you know, several times in terms of uh, communicating both internally and externally to, uh, to uh, suppliers and, and, and customers and so on. And of course, as we, as we do more and more of this communication like this in the virtual world, uh, I guess there's a tendency maybe sometimes just to be um, perhaps overstepping some of those uh, GDPR kind of rules and, and regulations. Lynn, do you want to do you want to just say anything quickly on GDPR as you see it? Um, well, it, we have um, because of the Data Protection Act 2018, then a major, vast majority of GDPR has gone into UK legislation. So even after December the 31st, it's not exactly the same, so there are some differences, but um, so for even with things like COVID, you have to have a, you just have to have said, you could keep that data for longer than 21 days, as long as you have documented why you are keeping it for longer than 21 days. So if you've got a business reason and you've documented it to say, we need these data for these reasons, this is why we're keeping it for longer, then you can keep it for longer. Um, but you can't just have data hanging around that has any kind of personal content. And of course, the time an individual arrives on site and leaves site is, is personal content. So you have to have had a process where you've documented why you're keeping the data, that you're keeping it secure, limited access, it's not just easily accessible to people, and your retention period. Um, so you aren't limited by the government's 21 days. So the 21 days is you must keep it at least for that because of other legislation. And therefore that overrides D GDPR in the fact that if there is another legislative re requirement, then you have to keep it. So tax records, six years. Um, but you do have to consciously have gone through this. Of course, with everything of this is you need to do it you know, the, the chance of the ICO coming around at the moment and penalising an individual business for this is very slim. They have lots of other things they're trying to do at the moment, but you just don't know if you're going to get an audit. So it, it, it's a really good idea to go through that process. Brilliant. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, Derek, one final comment from, from you then, and then we'll, uh, we'll have to wrap up, I'm afraid. You need to unmute, unmute, Derek. Um, can you hear me? We can now, yes. Sorry. Um, what I was I wanted to inter interested to know what people think about the Stobart announcement. Six million lost last year due to COVID. The sixteen million plus. It sound it's sending a message as though there's a lot of money about in this logistics market. What has any has anyone got any comment about that? Derek, I'm sure I'm sure there'll be lots of uh, comment about that, but I'm not quite sure that this is the forum uh, for that. No, one. no. <laughs> um, and maybe we can maybe we can set up a bit of a chat room or something to start tackling some of these kind of industry, uh, you know, industry uh, events and and uh, and trends. But thanks uh, thanks for raising that. I am conscious of the time and I know right. people have got other meetings to uh, to shoot off to. So I'm, I'm going to park it there um, and just say, look, thanks very much for, for to the panel for sharing their experiences and insights. And thanks to the audience for joining and joining in with the conversation. Um, I don't think this will be the last of these sessions uh, that we have. I've certainly picked out uh, a number of key things that we can uh, you know, we can pick up on clearly, you know, the big the big thing now as the industry goes through peak uh, is the impact of agency staff. So that's something we've got to be uh, particularly mindful of. Um, 
but I think this ongoing communication, which is what these things are about, sharing best practice, um, and uh, and again, as we do tend to sort of uh, say in concluding these sessions, um, another thing I've picked up is this great resilient workforce that you all seem to have in your businesses, and uh, you know it's a credit to this industry that it sort of stepped in when it did during COVID and uh, and kept the country uh, clothed and fed as it continues to do. So um, so thanks everyone for your uh, your input today. Um, we'll get this posted onto the website. Feel free to share it with your, your colleagues and um, we'll, uh, we'll maybe look forward to doing something like this again uh, before too long. Thanks a lot and uh, have a good day. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Peter. Thanks, everyone.